Arsenal 2, Luton Town 0. A big win for Arsenal last night. The result, more important than the performance. I don't think we really got out of second gear, but there's quite a few things I want to talk about. A couple of agendas bouncing around about players after last night. Some interesting comments from Rob Edwards and really the change in the Arsenal squad from this time last season. The run in last season compared to now. Um, which I think puts us in a far stronger position. If you're new to the channel, please do head below, drop a subscription, smash a like on the video if you could be so kind as well. We are on our way to 10,000 subscribers, and I massively appreciate the support recently on the channel. It's been absolutely unbelievable. But look, last night, we saw rotation, more rotation, I think, than even I expected. And it was funny, because throughout most of the day, the last couple of days, um, even on the live stream that we did, the preview stream, we'd all kind of asked for rotation, some more than others. I wanted a fair bit of rotation. And then the team news came out and there was rotation. And suddenly a lot of people went, oh, oh, I don't know if I actually like this now. Um, because we've we've seen it previously where we have rotated and, you know, it's not worked. It's not worked. We've had issues when we've rotated that much in the past. Um, and so there was a little bit of doubt among some people as to whether it would go well last night, especially because of some of the changes. You know, even I didn't expect Reese Nelson and Smith Rowe to come in. I said that I'd happily see them come on at half time. Um, you know, if we'd kind of put the game to bed by that point, but I was delighted to see them both in the starting lineup. Absolutely delighted. I know some people aren't sure if we can do the Erdegaard and another 10, whether that's Smith Rowe or Trossard or whoever else, especially when the holding midfielder is Thomas Partey rather than Declan Rice. And, you know, there was an element of risk to it. Of course, there was an element of risk. But equally, and this is the part where I think, you know, some people didn't acknowledge it, there's there's also an element of risk of going full strength. And the element of risk there is that we end up with a burnt-out team before the end of the season, or we pick up injuries to key players that we didn't really need to do. So I think it was, in the end, the right mix of rotation and securing the win in terms of you know still having white Saliba Gabriel the core of the defense was still there so defensively we were solid as normal having Erdegaard in there I think was really important and I think he had a fantastic game um and and actually I think having Kai Havertz in there was really important as well and, and I thought he had a really good game um apart from the booking the booking was quite annoying because if you're not aware Kai Havertz there are two more games for explain this properly if you pick up 10 bookings before the 32nd game of the season, you get a two-game ban. Kai Havertz going into last night's game was on seven with three games to go. So if he gets booked in all three of those games, he gets a two-match ban. He was effectively a second away from not picking up a booking last night uh, before he got subbed off and then picked up a yellow. So he is still in a little bit of danger. If he gets booked in both of the next two games, he'll then be suspended for two games, which would be bad. But look, it's a minor thing. And outside of that, I thought his all-round game was pretty good. So the rotation was good. Smith Rowe came in, one man of the match. If I'm completely honest, listen, I am Smith Rowe's biggest fan. I don't think he deserved man of the match, actually, based on the game. Uh, if, if I was objectively looking at who I thought was the best player on the pitch last night, for me, it was Martin Odegaard. But, Smithrow, especially in the first half, was very, very good. He was sharp. He was alert. His movement was brilliant. Um, the well, I don't think it actually went down as an assist, but for the second goal, the own goal, his play in, in that was brilliant. It's a shame he didn't score that chance that was wonderfully set up for him by Martin Odegaard. If he'd scored that, happy days. Um, but all around, his game was good. Trossard came in, I thought had an all right game. Um, Reese Nelson wasn't at his best, in my opinion. I think he's better off the left. You know, I think he's better off the left, cutting inside. A few times you saw him kind of pick up the ball and run in field and then end up dropping it back to a defender. And it's like, you're the guy with the pace. You're the guy that can take a player on. I want you to be more direct. I want you running towards goal, not across the pitch. Um, so, but look, you know, that was his first start since 2020. So I will give him a little bit of leeway. And then Zinchenko came in and... For me, Zinchenko had a really good game. And I do think this is where agendas begin to agenda because I know people, you know, for various reasons don't like Zinchenko. Some of it's because of his political opinion. I'm not really interested in that. I'm going to judge a player based on how they've played. And, um, you know, I thought he was one of our better players on the pitch last night. And and like I said, for whatever reason, people kind of decided he had a bad game. And, and some of it's because 
people have an idea in their head that he loses the ball too much, that he's got the bozo gene, he makes too many mistakes. And then so when he does lose the ball, they hyper fixate on it compared to if another player lost the ball. You know, Smith Rowe lost the ball a couple of times. It wasn't mentioned. Zinchenko does it and it's heavily mentioned. And he is a risky player. He takes risks that other players wouldn't take. And sometimes that can put you in a little bit of danger. But sometimes it can cut a team open and create a goal. So, you know, you, you, you've you got sort of both both options there. And look, I'm not saying Zinchenko needs to be our starting left back for the rest of the season. I'm not saying that. I think Kivior will come back in. Um, but I don't think he's anywhere near as bad as some people were making out. I think he is still a very good squad player to have. And it's frustrating. It is frustrating to see that kind of... Uh, to see that kind of commentary about him. So look, I'm going to bring up, I'm going to bring up the, uh, the, the stats. And this was the squad. And look, Zinchenko was our second highest rated player on FOTMOB. Now these ratings, you know, a lot of it's to do with how much you're on the ball and stuff. So that helps him out. But I mean, if we bring up his individual stats, played 74 minutes, um, 84% pass accuracy. I don't know if that's, uh, well, we can check the others, but I don't think that's particularly worse than anyone else on the pitch in an Arsenal shirt. Um, created a chance. In attack, had 84 touches. All right, his accurate long balls weren't great. Five passes into the final third. But defensively, he was rock solid last night. Two out of two tackles. One, five clearances, a headed clearance, two interceptions, nine defensive actions, and eight recoveries. I don't think anyone made more recoveries in the game than Zinchenko did. And when it came to his duels, which people think he's weak on, he had five of them, and he won all five. Three, three on the ground and two in the air. So... You know, I just, I, I do think there was a bit of an overreaction to him. Thomas Partey, ex I accept, I don't think Thomas Partey looked anywhere near his best last night. I think he looked rusty. I'd expect him to look rusty. But the difference is, when Julian Timber comes back into the team, I expect he'll look rusty. And I think people will give him a lot more time and a lot more support in looking rusty than they've given to these two. And, and I get it. People don't like them. There's an agenda. But if you're judging it purely based on football, I think people just have to be fair about it. I thought Gabriel was an absolute monster again last night, as was Saliba. Um, that is, in the space of three days, on Sunday, we ended Man City's run of 57 consecutive games where they scored at the Etihad. And yesterday, believe it or not, Luton Town were on the longest streak of consecutive Premier League games where they had scored, of any Premier League team. Uh, 18 games in a row they'd scored in. And uh, we ended that as well. So we, we really are a, a defensive masterclass. Uh, David Raya now has three more clean sheets than any other keeper in the league. He didn't even start the first four games of the season and he missed the game against Brighton recently. So that's absolutely sensational for him. And all round, it was a solid performance. Now, some people are saying, oh, we needed to go out there and score four or five. We didn't. We didn't need to go out there and score four or five. And this is where I think the change from last season is. Last season, at this stage of the season, was when we began, you know, drawing two all against West Ham drawing three all against Southampton. We were leaky at the back. We were on edge. And this was a professional performance. This was, this was truthfully, this was the sort of performance that you expect to see from Man City in the final nine, ten games of a season. Where they turn up, they don't get out of second gear, they win quite comfortably, they move on to the next one. Rotated players, you know, it really, it couldn't have gone much better last night. Like, sure, we could have turned up even with, this massively rotated team and won 5 0. And it would have been like, oh my God, even our reserve team is firing. Um, especially against what was a weakened Luton team, right? There's no doubt about it. It was a weakened Luton team. But not every game's going to be like that. Not every, you know, we got used to winning games 5 6 0. Not every game's going to be like that. And games like this are absolutely fine. Um, a lot of talk has been made this morning about the atmosphere at the Emirates last night. Obviously, I was there. The atmosphere wasn't the best, you know, it wasn't rocking, you know, because it was Luton at home on a Wednesday evening. That's, you know, that's standard. I'll be honest, uh, having been to every home game for the last, I don't know, two and a half years, that's standard. And I'll tell you a big difference, though, between last night and again, last season, that Southampton game, the crowd were on edge. The crowd, every time someone lost a ball, it was like, ooh. And obviously that game didn't help because we had gone 1-0 down early on, but the crowd has changed. And realistically, you know, everyone turned up expecting to win this game. That You know, they, they, there's just, the crowd doesn't get as emotional, which usually leads to the atmosphere when it's a game like this. And you'll see that at Anfield. You'll see that at, um, you know, the Etihad. I mean, the Etihad is like that every week. But you, you'll see that across the board. 
you know, not every game is going to be absolutely... And in some ways, it doesn't need to be. You know, Arsenal didn't get out of second gear last night, and nor did the crowd. And if the crowd are massively up for it, I honestly feel like it can be a little bit de detrimental to the players in a game like this. Um, so, yeah, you know, and, and people were leaving before the end of the game. Again, like normally, I mean, Southampton last season, we were 3-1 down with 10 minutes to go and people were leaving and I was absolutely fuming at them. I remember tweeting about it saying it was outrageous. But, you know, last night, the, the tubes at the moment are a bit of a mess anyway. People have got to get home. Um, it was a comfortable game. Realistically, it was, the second half was not particularly entertaining. We weren't massively attacking. I thought once Havertz went off, Eddie came on. I didn't think Eddie was brilliant. I, I, and the one thing is, Eddie had a couple of sniffs at goal, right? But our, our, our all-round attack when we took off Havertz and brought on Eddie is way diminished. And that's where you don't even need to appreciate and see what Havertz is doing on the ball. But just look at the, the way our all-round attack functions when Havertz goes off and someone like Eddie comes on. Because then you start to realize, okay, Havertz is clearly doing things that I'm not seeing. I mean, personally, I do feel like I see it and I appreciate Havertz. But even for those that don't, just look at the difference it makes when he's not on the field. Um, and so, yeah, the, the end of the game, it, it was a bit boring and people were leaving and it was a bit quiet. And that's just, yeah, it's run of the mill for this sort of game. Just honestly, it is. So I don't massively have an issue with that. And now we move on to Brighton away. You know, now we move on to Brighton away. I think we catch them at quite a good time. You know, if you if you look at uh, Brighton last night, they drew. They were in London. They drew away at, uh, at Brentford. The team that they put out, you know, they're still not really uh, at full strength. This, this is not their best team by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, the subs, Welbeck and Lampdy and Moda, no one else really on the bench. Um, interesting, they rested someone like Purvis of Stupinian, but I would expect this to go away to Brighton and win. I think we'll go full strength against Brighton. I think we have to away. Um They've had a trickier midweek fixture than we have. They've had more travel. They won't have much time to prepare for that game. It's on Saturday. And so I would expect this to go there and win. Obviously, I will have the preview for that game on stream tomorrow evening. I'll be back live tonight, half six as usual, to, to talk about last night's game and see how we're feeling. Talk about Man City's win as well, which was obviously a big win for them. Frustrating that Unai Emery made it so easy for them. Uh, but yeah, I'll be live at half six. If you're not already, please do subscribe, smash a like on the video if you enjoyed it. And uh, I will catch you at half six or I'll catch you on the next video. But until